thank you pray that as we navigate this life that we may truly come to see that our purpose our meaning and our lives being fulfilled comes only by glorifying you. Amen. Father, we ask this prayer in faith and we give thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us unto him. Somebody ought to say amen. amen. Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. All oh, the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord or who hath been his counselor? Or who hath first given to him? And it shall be recompensed unto him again. For of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen. You may say, what are you getting at? I want us to understand that to God be all the glory, honor, and praise. <laughs> Hebrews 13, 20, and 21 says, now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight. Through Christ Jesus, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. See, some of us may be tired of glorifying God already, but I'll never get tired of glorifying God. And that's why I want to call your attention to the book of Judges. Because we have to understand that the very reason, the very purpose for us breathing oxygen in and out right now is for us to glorify God. This is the reason that we were created. The Ephesians says, Paul says in Ephesians, unto the praise of his glory. He created us so that we can worship and praise him. Is that all right? 
And today I want to look at a man named Gideon. And we looked at him on yesterday in our class on judges, so y'all act like y'all didn't hear nothing yesterday. But in the book of Judges, chapter 7, we see a man named Gideon who then became known as Jeroboam. And he's preparing for battle. And we need to understand that it's important not to forget how he became Jeroboam. You see, a lot of us are known for a lot of things in life. And amen, somebody, it's not good things that we're known for sometimes. Is that all right? So to, to summarize verse or chapter 6, if you will, you have to understand that God's people were, during this time, going through cycles of life where they would be faithful to God and then become unfaithful to God, then God would sell them into captivity. And you say, well, what do you mean God sold them or would sell them into captivity? You see, God only gives us what we've already chosen. Is that all right? So when God sells us or when God gives us over, so to speak, he's only given us or selling us to what we have already chosen in our hearts anyway. So we can't blame God. It's what we ourselves truly want, and God knows our heart. So God had delivered them into the hands of the Midianites, and the Midianites oppressed them, not by war, but oppressed them by, by squatting on their land and taking everything they would have to a point where God's people had to live in caves. And in these caves, they had to hide whatever they can scrounge up to feed their families and live. They had to hide so that the Midianites wouldn't come and take it. And God always, when his people finally cried out and repented, God always would send a deliverer to deliver them out of the hands of the ones who captured them. You remember Jesus talked about taking captivity captive. In other words, God sent deliverers to recapture his people who had been captured. And for all of us, we've been captured by sin, but God has sent his son to recapture us out of captivity. Somebody ought to be thankful this morning. You see, Gideon had some of the same problems and issues we have. Sometimes we don't think we're worth it. Many times we don't think we have what it takes. I'm not from the right family, not from the right stock. I don't have the right last name. People don't think a lot of me. And many times we go through life with a pessimistic, defeatist mentality because of what we don't have. But God doesn't look at what we don't have God looks at what we do have. And it's not that we have anything, but as long as we have him, we have everything we need. Are y'all getting this? So Gideon, like us, sometimes always has to ask God, well, well God, if, if I'm a mighty man of valor, if, if I'm going to deliver your people out of the hands of the Midianites, uh, approve it. And we understand that today we don't live in an age of miracles. God is not going to prove nothing to us. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. If you're not going to believe word, God's word, then don't look for it. Amen. Don't look for it any other way. Stop trying to interpret stuff in life as if God is trying to talk to you. God talks through his word and that's it. Hebrews chapter 1 and verses 1 and 2. God in sundry times, he, he used to talk to people with donkeys and he used to talk through dreams. He used to talk face to face, but now he speaks to us through his dear son. And if you're not getting it from the word, then I don't know what you're getting. Be 
careful. A lot of people today saying, well, God told me this. Well, if he ain't tell you this from this. Amen, somebody. Nevertheless, Gideon was chosen by God. He asked God, I, I, I need some reassurance, God. I, I need to know that you're going to be with me. And God gave him reassurance. Then, in the verses 25 through 32, are, are very important. And I won't go through it all, but God commanded that Gideon destroy the altars and the Asherah poles that were dedicated to Baal, the false god. And we have to understand that in our lives, before God can use us, there's some things in our lives that, that, that used to be dedicated to the world that we have to destroy. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? There's some things in our lives, before we can truly serve God, there's some things in our lives that are dedicated to the world that we need to throw down, that we need to destroy first before we can be successful in serving God. Because Jesus said, no man can serve two masters. Is that all right? Are we getting this? So Gideon had to destroy the altar and, and the, the Asherah pole that his father had set up. And, and some of us are, are, have some things in our lives that are dedicated to the world, and maybe they were instilled in us by our own parents, by our own families. And we have to destroy it. We have to tear it down because some of us have went through life and all you've had was people tell you you wasn't nothing, you never be nothing, you're just like your mama, you're just like your daddy. And you have to destroy that. You have to tear it down. So Gideon had faith enough to do what God said. And he got his own house in order. And he was so effective in what he did. And he didn't go and ask his family, is this okay to do? He just did it. He did it to a point where even his father stood up when they came looking for him to kill him. They said, who tore down these, uh, the, the altar and the Asherah pole? Who did this? And he said, my son did it. And he said, well, listen. Y'all, why y'all looking for him? I'm just paraphrasing. Y'all looking to kill him. Why don't y'all let Baal defend himself? If he did something to Baal, let Baal do something to him. Is that all right? And as we learned from the class yesterday, we, we understand. You see, when you take a stand for what's right, you don't need a crowd. You don't need support. You take a stand for what's right, and you will encourage others to take a stand. Is that all right? Sometimes we look, we wait to stand up for what's right to see, well, who's going to be with me? Understand, when you're serving God, won't many be with you? And even those closest to you, you still got to worry about them because they don't have the right motive. Is that all right? So you just have to stand and do what's right. But understand, he needed to remove those things in his life before he can serve God, before he can find the true purpose of his life, which is to glorify God. You see, I'm here to tell you because some of us come to worship looking for the preacher to say something that I'm interested in that I'm looking for. I need a bigger house. Or I need a house, period. Amen, somebody. I need a better job. I need more money. I need this. And I'm looking for the preacher to say something. And if he doesn't say something about those things that I place value on, then, man, that sermon was nothing, man. I didn't get nothing from that sermon. You need to understand I need to understand that God's word is relevant 
regardless of what you place value on. You see, the problem is this. It's our minds that are focused on the things that are truly irrelevant. And God is trying to tell us, listen, you're looking for things, you're looking for possessions, you're looking for relationships to satisfy you and fulfill you and to make you meaningful when nothing, nothing will make you fulfilled other than a relationship with me. And that's why you have all this in the world of religion. You have all these people flocking to where they can get some false hope. Well, pastor said I'm going to get my anointing this year. I'm going to get my blessing this year. Well, what pastor forgot to tell you is that God gave his son and you're already blessed. You already got your anointing. I want you to go with me real quick before we move on. Go with me to Psalm, Psalm 16. Psalm 16. You see, we're looking mistakenly, we're looking to enjoy God by what he can give us. And when we look to enjoy God by what he can give us, then we fail to enjoy God for who he is. Psalm 16. Psalm 16. Verses 8 and 9. If you have a say, amen. The word of God says, this is Don, David, I have set the Lord always before me. Amen, somebody. You see, the Lord can't be behind you. Because people always say, well, the Lord is with me. No, you got to be with the Lord. Is that all right? He said, I've set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Is that all right? Therefore, my heart is glad. Why? Because he's with me. I'm with him. Therefore, my heart is glad. No matter what the conditions and circumstances of life are, as long as I'm with God, everything is all right. Therefore, my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My, my flesh also shall rest in hope. But jump down to verse 11. Watch this. Thou wilt show me the path of life. You see, sometimes we, we think we know where we're going in life. Oh, I know what direction I'm going. I know what I got to do to be happy. It's not in man that walketh to direct his own steps. You ever notice you can't even make yourself happy? Just think about that. You can't even make yourself happy. That's why people got to tell you, cheer up. You can't even cheer yourself up. Thou wilt show me the path of life. Now watch this. In thy presence. Are y'all getting this? In thy presence is fullness of joy. Now what you and I need to do is understand what biblical joy is. Because, see, we seek after happiness when the Bible speaks of joy. Joy is, is related to being content. And when you're content, amen, in Christ Jesus, then you're okay no matter what the situation is. Is that all right? He says, in thy presence is fullness of joy at thy right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. So we need to understand, we, we need to readjust and reexamine what we consider joy, what we consider peace, what we consider something to be valued. 
that's in the presence of God. But the world convinces us, unless you have this, unless you have that, unless you're in this type of relationship, you should be unhappy. You have no joy. Life is meaningless. You're unfulfilled. And all this foolishness. We seek after things, and watch this. Things are insatiable. They'll never satisfy. You think if you was a billionaire, that would be it. You can just stop, right? But even billionaires trying to make more money. And more and more. It's never enough. Is that all right? Let's go back. Judges. Just trying to show us that as we're learning in our Saturday classes, we have a lot of coping problems. And we fail to realize that the root of all of our problems is spiritual. When you're not align with your purpose, which is to glorify God, everything else will not line up right. Judges, chapter 7. Watch this. Verse 2. The Lord said unto Gideon, The people that are with thee are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands. You see, God had prepared him for battle. He's ready for battle. And at this point, as we'll see in the next verse, Israel has about 32,000 troops compared to the Midianites who had about, according to chapter 8 and verse 10, about 132,000. So 32,000 against 132,000. And God says, 32,000 is too many for me. Y'all got too many. He says, the people that are with thee are too many for me to, for me to give, for me to give, for me to give the Midianites into their hands, lest Israel vault themselves against me, saying, mine own hand hath saved me. Now, what does it mean to vault? This word in the Hebrew means to boast in such a way in which you claim or you attribute glory and honor to yourself rather than to God. You see, God knows our hearts. No matter what, how, how much we try to set up and say, Lord, I just want to do this to glorify you. God knows your heart. And he tells them, the people you have are too many. Is that all right? He says, now therefore go to, proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, whoever is fearful and afraid, let him return and depart early from the Mount of Gilead. Now watch this. Let me go back up. Because he says, it's too many people, lest Israel shall vault themselves against me. You see, God has to put us in situations so that we know that it's about him and not about us. Is that all right? 1 Corinthians chapter 4 in the verse 7 says it like this. In the NLT it says, For what gives you the right to make such a judgment or boast? What do you have that God hasn't given you? Can you think of one thing you have that you can possibly boast about that God didn't give you? And if everything you have is from God, why boast as though it were not a gift? So we go around sometimes 
seeking to boast, seeking to glory about things that God gave us. Like we made it happen ourselves. And I know some of you right now are thinking, well, I'm the one who get up and go to work. Well, first of all, God got you up. You could have stayed asleep. And I'm not talking about resting. Amen, somebody. Is that all right? Well, I'm the one who got up. I'm the one who go and do it. We talked about it on yesterday. You can have all the possessions in the world, but if you don't have your health, you don't got nothing. Woke up this morning, my throat was killing me. I'm thinking to myself, I ain't going to make it. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? You better thank God. You say, I can only breathe out of one nostril. Thank God. You don't have to be breathing out of either one of them. Is that all right? Are we getting this? He says the people are too many. You, we need to understand that God doesn't need great numbers in order to accomplish his will because the battle is truly his and not ours. You see, God alone, God don't need 150 or however many is in here right now. God don't need all of us to do his will in Glenville and in Cleveland. So never get beside yourself. Never get beside myself into thinking that we're doing God a favor. Is that all right? Well, I just placed my membership somewhere else. Whoa, whoa. Okay. <laughs> Glory be to God that you are a member in the body of Christ, period. You don't have to be nowhere. Is that all right? Are we getting this? We need God. God is the one who brings about victory and success. Is that all right? So now he says, watch this. He says, you have too many people. Verse 3, now therefore go, proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, whoever is fearful and afraid, let him return and depart early from Mount Gilead. And there return of the people 22,000, and there remain 10,000. So of the 32,000, 22,000 were fearful, were afraid, cowards. God knows. See, God is the one who weeds. Y'all remember the parable of the, the, the tares and the wheat? He said, don't touch them. I'll do the separating. Is that all right? God is the one, when he's accomplishing his will, let him weed out. It's not for us to do. Is that all right? And God is just awesome. His wisdom is just far beyond ours. You say, well, why did he got... You know, why did he weed out the fearful? Because guess what? If, if you're in a war, if you're in a battle, you don't want a coward next to you. Amen, hey somebody. Some of you, we've all had friends. Come here, Floyd. We, we've all had friends where we're about to go into battle. Is that right? You going into battle, you walking together, you going into battle, yeah, yeah. Push him so you can run. <laughs> then after you take your beat and you go looking for him. <laughs> Why you leave, man? Oh, my, my, I heard my mom calling me, I think. Uh, <laughs> 
So God has to weed out those who are fearful. They shouldn't have been there in the first place. Is that all right? Now watch verse 4 because he says, And the Lord said unto Gideon, There's only 10,000 left now. And the Lord said unto Gideon, The people are yet too many. Now you have 132, 135,000 against 10,000, and God is still saying 10,000 is still too many for me to deliver the Midianites into their hand. If you got 10,000, y'all still gonna fall and boast and take the glory for yourself. So that's too many people. Is that all right? Watch what he tells them to do. Bring them down unto the water and I will try them for thee there. And it shall be that of whom I say unto thee, this shall go with thee, the same shall go with thee. Notice he told them, whomever I tell you. Is that all right? We have to always pay attention to what the Lord says. Because sometimes we read the scriptures and we understand what God says, but we're looking at a, a situation or condition and we're like, Lord, I, I, this situation looks different from what you're saying. So I, I'm not sure if I should trust what you're saying based on what I see. And God has said, I don't care what you see, you do what I told you to do. I didn't ask you to lean to your own understanding. Is that all right? We talked a few weeks ago about seeing the unseen. That's true faith. Is that all right? Watch what he says. And of whomsoever I shall say unto thee, this shall not go with thee, the same shall not go. Verse 5, so he brought down the people unto the water. And the Lord said unto Gideon, Everyone that lappeth of the water with his tongue, as a dog lappeth, him shalt thou set by himself. Likewise, everyone that boweth down upon his knees to drink. And the number of them that lap, putting their hand to their mouth, cuffing, and putting it to their mouth were 300 men. But all the rest of the people bowed down upon their knees to drink the water. You say, what's the, what's the point of this? Again, God's wisdom is far beyond our wisdom. God is saying, even though these people aren't fearful, I still want to watch them to see how they're going to drink some water. You got some people who are going to go down there and drink some water, and they got their weapons with them. Amen. They're moderate. They cuff their hands. They drink water, but they're still alert. They're still attentive. They still know what's going on. Is that all right? But then you got some people who go down and drink water and they go, oh, oh. <laughs> ain't paying attention to nobody. Just worried about themselves and drinking water. Put their, put their weapon down. Amen. They're self-consumed. So watch what God does. Verse 7. And the Lord said unto Gideon, by the 300 men that lapped, will I save you and deliver the Midianites into thine hand. And let all the other people go every man into his place. In other words, 9,700 people went down there and just self-indulged and wasn't attentive, wasn't alert, wasn't vigilant. But 300 went and they were. They were alert. And I'm here to tell you, church, you don't want people leading you that's not alert, that's not vigilant, that's not watchful. Is that all right? Somebody will get hurt. Amen, somebody. And sometimes we have servants in God's house that are, are not vigilant. They're not watchful. And you can tell because sometimes when things come up, they're uncomfortable to say some things. They don't want to say some things. They, they, they're scared to stand sometimes. And you don't want somebody like that leading you. Mm. 
Watch this. God says, by 300 men, 300, 135,000 against 300. Now, how many of you take them out? None of you. But as long as the 300 or one has God, I'll take them out all day long. Are we getting this? We need to understand. Watch this. He said, again, because we need to pay attention to context. In verse 7, he says, by the 300 men that left, will I save you and deliver the Midianites into thy hand? You see, he has to continually remind Gideon, I'm doing it. It's not about you or the 300. It's about me being with you. Is that all right? Now watch this. Even with that, so the people took their victuals or pictures in their hand and their trumpets, the 300 he's talking about, and sent all the rest of Israel, every man, into his tent and retained those 300 men. And the host of Midian was beneath him in the valley. Now watch this. Verse 9, And it came to pass the same night that the Lord said unto him, Arise, I have, I have, I have delivered it into thine hand. Now, how many reassurances has God already provided Gideon? So you, ought to, you would think that Gideon by now has enough faith to just go and do what God said. But I'm here to tell you, even when, we, when we're going along with what God is saying, God still knows our heart. God still knows our makeup. And some of us are still just going along even though we may have some doubts, even though we may not have all the faith and trust and reliance in God, and, and we think within ourselves, and we don't say it, but we think within ourselves. And when we think within ourselves, we think that God can't hear within ourselves, but God knows your heart too. I'm going to prove it to you. Watch this. Verse 10, he says, But if thou fear to go down, now, how would God know he, he still feared? But if thou fear to go down, go thou with Furah, thy servant, down to the host, and thou shalt hear what they say. And afterward, thine hand shall be strengthened to go down into the host. In other words, Gideon, you're following through, but you still doubt. So take Furah with you. And go hear what they say. Then you'll be strengthened. Is that all right? So he takes Pharaoh down. Watch this. Then when he down with Pharaoh, that's inference for, yeah, I do fear. And I'm going to take him down. Are y'all getting that? Then when he down with Pharaoh, his servant, unto the outside of the armed men that were in the host. And the Midianites and the Amalekites and all the children of the east lay along in the valley like grasshoppers for a multitude, a lot of them. And their camels were without number as the sand by the seaside for the multitude. And when Gideon was come, behold, there was a man that told a dream unto his fellow and said, Behold, I dreamed a dream, and lo, a cake of barley bread tumbled into the host of Midian and came into a tent and smote it that it fell over and overturned it that the tent lay long alone. And his fellow answered and said, This is nothing else save the sword of Gilead, the son of Joash, a man of Israel, for into, in, into his hand hath God delivered Midian and all the hosts. Here we go. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. And it was so when Gideon heard the telling of the dream and the interpretation thereof that he worshipped. That he worshipped and returned into the host of Israel 
and said, Arise, for the Lord hath delivered into your hand the host of Midian. He needed more reassurance from God that what God said is true. How much more reassurance do you and I need this morning that what God says is true? Are we getting this? Now watch this. So they go and they fight and I, I have to hasten. They fight and they take nothing with them but their pitchers and their trumpets 300 men. And Gideon tells them, follow me and do what I do. And they're surrounding Midian and all their hosts, because it was a lot of them together. They surround them, and it's dark. They turn on their lights and their, their pictures, and then they blow their trumpets. And that's what was explained to us yesterday. When you blew a trumpet, just one, that meant that you had a whole host of people with you. Okay? So they blow 300 trumpets. And they got their lights on. So you can imagine what Midian thought when they looked up, heard all these trumpets, saw all these lights. They were scared to death. Watch this. Verse 21 says, And they stood every man, talking about Midian, and he stood every man in his place round about the camp, and all the hosts ran and cried and fled. You see, when God is with you, no one can be against you. But watch this. Verse 22 says, And the 300 blew the trumpets, and the Lord set every man's sword against his fellow. Talking about Midian. The Lord set every man's sword against his fellow. The Lord set every man's sword against his fellow. The Lord set every man's sword against his fellow. Even throughout all the hosts. See, y'all ain't getting that. You're not getting the fact that when God is with you, he will take your enemies out by your enemies. They were fighting each other. And sometimes people try to come together to take you out. They try to scheme and do all these things. Man, we going to get them. And then God turns them on themselves. Yes, sir. Confusion. God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. So all we got to do is continue to do what God said and let God deal with them. Are y'all doing, are y'all hearing this? Watch this. Gideon pursues them. And we're hastening to our conclusion because Gideon pursues them, and two of the kings of Midian, Ziba and Zalmunna, escapes. So when we get in chapter 8, Gideon is still pursuing them. And as Gideon is pursuing them, he goes up to Succoth in Penuel, and he asked for some assistance, some support. And it's something when you're doing the work of God when people won't support you. I wish I had time. That's a whole nother sermon. And, and they refuse to help the man of God. They, they know that they're fighting for the Lord, but they refuse to help him because they say, well, are, are y'all, did y'all capture them yet? Are y'all in control yet? So why do y'all want us to help y'all? And, and, and Gideon says, okay. When I come back through here, it's going to be some recompense time to pay. 
Is that all right? And when you read in chapter 8, or you read it for yourself, when you read in chapter 8, he actually catches those kings, and he goes back to suck up and pin you, and he does to them exactly what he said. He delivers justice. You see, God is a God of justice. Amen, somebody. And sometimes in your life when you're going through some things and, and people uh, that should help you, that don't help you, and then when God brings you to the point where he exalts you, then those people act like they supported you all along. And they didn't. But it's not about supporting Gideon. It's about supporting the Lord. It's about doing his will. And people always want to take, oh, man, I knew you'd be able to do it. Oh, man, I was always in your corner. You see, but we have to be careful. Because as good as this story was, it doesn't end well. You have to be careful when God brings victory and success. Chapter 8, verse 22, as we close, says, Then the men of Israel said unto Gideon, Rule thou over us. In other words, be our king. Both thou and thy son and thy son's son also. For thou hast delivered us from the hand of Midian. Strike three. You see, sometimes when God works through you and I to accomplish his will, sometimes people look at you and I as if we didn't. And you have to be cautious you have to be humble not to take credit that belongs to God. Are we getting this? For thou hast delivered us from the hand of Midian. They, they, they missed altogether that it wasn't Gideon, it wasn't the 300, it was God. Verse 23, Gideon says unto them, I will not rule over you. Neither shall my son rule over you. The Lord shall rule over you. In other words, you have to understand, Israel said, we, we need a king. We don't have a king. We want you to be our king. And they failed to realize they already had one. His name was God, Jehovah. Is that all right? And many times we look for kings and people we want to give glory to men when all glory, honor, and praise belongs to God. And I'm going to show you why. And I'm not saying, I'm, I'm saying don't go beyond, 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 6 says, don't go beyond what is written. You honor what God said honor. And as far as men, when you're talking about servants in the kingdom of God, the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians, you esteem them in love, highly in love, for the work's sake. For the work's sake. Amen, somebody. For the work's sake. For the work's sake. Because the work is God's work. So honor them, esteem them in love, highly, for the work's sake. It's not a work that any and everybody can do. Amen, somebody. You have to put your life on the line. You have to put your family on the line. You're going through hell and nobody knows. But yet they still walk from you. They still walk from you. They still walk from you. God forbid if you're having a bad day. Sometimes people ask you how you're doing just so you can listen to them and see what their problems are. Y'all will get that when you get home. <laughs> hey, how you doing today, Brother Rich? Oh, you doing, uh, you're not doing so good? Okay, well, I just want to talk to you because I got this going on.
Who's going to be there to listen to Rich? And Tangela when they're having a bad day. Who's going to listen to Merv and Italian when they're going through hell and high winds in their life? That's why we all need to, we all need to learn from David. There's sometimes you have to encourage yourself in the Lord. And I'm not here trying to give a pity party. I'm not here trying to distinguish between members and, and servants because we're all unprofitable servants. But we need to be considerate one of another. Is that all right? And understand we all get our renewed strength from God. Amen, somebody. Sometimes we are on the brink of leaving God because somebody didn't do something for us. Well, you tell me what God didn't do for you to cause you to leave him. God has done nothing but good to you. Well, you know, it's hypocrites down there. There's hypocrites on your job. You go every day. Ain't no love down there. Ain't no love on your job. You go every day. People did me wrong down there. People did you wrong in your family. You still have Thanksgiving. You still get the dressing, mac and cheese, greens, and everything else. And they did you wrong. Ain't apologizing. Ain't thinking about apologizing. Amen. They don't want you over their house in the first place, but you still go. You see what God has to put up with us? Watch this. Be careful not to give glory where it's not due. All glory belongs to God. Verse 24, and Gideon said unto them, right after he said, the Lord will rule over you. And Gideon said unto them, I would desire a request of you, that you would give me every man the earrings of his prey. For they had golden earrings because they were Ishmaelites. In other words, all the Midianites that they defeated, they took all their spoils. And a lot of them were Ishmaelites and they wore earrings, so they had all these gold earrings. They had all, all, a whole bunch of other stuff, so they didn't care about giving Gideon their earrings. They threw it all in there, says... Verse 25, and they answer, we will give willingly, we will willingly give them. And they spread a garment and did cast therein every man the earrings of his prey. And the weight of the golden earrings that he requested was 1,700 shekels of gold, about 50 pounds. Ooh, what would you do with 50 pounds of gold today? <laughs> besides ornaments and collars and purple raiment, that was on the kings of Midian and beside the chains that were about the, the camel's necks. So they gave this to Gideon. But watch this, verse 27. And Gideon made an ephod thereof and put it in his city, even an Ophrah. And all Israel went thither a whoring after it, which thing became a snare unto Gideon and to his house. You see, even so-called successful, victorious people for God make mistakes. So you can't put your confidence in men. You can't put your faith in men. Your faith, your trust, your reliance, your dependence has to be on God. Now you say, well, what's the, what was wrong about him making an ephod? God had reserved back in Exodus 28, in the verses 28 through 30, God had reserved the ephod for the high priest only. The ephod was like a breastplate where the high priest would put stones of Urim and Thummim in order to inquire of God, God, we need your direction. Where should we go? It was supposed to be for God and the high priest alone. 
But this man took it upon himself to say, you know what, huh? I'm going to make something like that. And sometimes we have good intentions. But sometimes our good intentions are additions to what God said. And when we make an addition to what God said, then sometimes people wind up following the addition that we made and not God. We need to understand as a congregation, as a congregation, we're not here following any man. We're not following anything. We're following God. And even though we've been called Hoganites, the Parkers, ruling now, it's God who rules alone. That's it. And as long as God is on the throne, and as long as God is ruling, there's nothing no one can do about it. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? You say you're speaking kind of strong. And I'm not apologizing. Not apologizing. When God makes you stand, there's nothing man can do about it. It's not about us. It never has been about us. It never will be about us. To God be all the glory, honor, and praise. Make sure that you are converted to God and not people and not a place. Say, so why you say that? Because I've seen some people just committed to, well, uh, my family been here for years, got false doctrine and everything else going on, and you just staying there because of what? Well, I feel like I'd be going against mom and daddy if I left. You got to save your own soul. This place is not the church. We are the church. Is that all right? If this place, if we leave this place, this place is just a place. I was about to say something else. But this is just a building. I'm here on Tuesdays through Saturdays, and I'm here a lot by myself sometimes when I'm not counseling or doing whatever, and I come in here, and this place is empty. It's dead. It has no life in it. Why? Because the church is not here other than me. Are y'all getting this? So we don't go to church. We are the church. So when we leave here, where's the church going? You said the church going to get something to eat. <laughs> hey man, hurry up, sit down. Hey man, somebody, I've said enough. You here today, you've not obeyed the gospel. I want to extend to you the greatest invitation ever known to man. The greatest invitation ever known to man. Bible. You must hear the word of God. This is the plan of salvation. You must hear the word of God. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. There will be no obedience to the gospel of Jesus Christ without first hearing what you need to do. Faith is not something from within yourself or myself. God is the one who gives faith by the, by the preaching and teaching of his word. Then we have to believe what we hear. Believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Repent of our sin. Turn from the world. Make up our minds that we want to change. And understand that there is no change without God in your life. Confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God before men. And that God raised him from the dead on the third day. Confess that with your mouth. Romans 10, 9 and 10. For confession is made unto salvation. Unto meaning you're on your way. 
You say, well, if confession is unto, then what's into? Baptism. Galatians 3, 26 and 27, for you are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into, into Christ, have put on Christ. You can't put on Christ without being buried in water baptism. That's what God said. I know what people are saying in the religious world today. Well, you don't need baptism. That's just an outward sign of inward grace and all this other stuff. I'd rather trust Jesus. And in his word, in the book of Acts, the history of the church, there's no one who came to the church or was added to the church without being baptized. No one. I'm glad you said, well, what about the thief on the cross? Jesus saved him. The church was not in existence yet. How could he believe the gospel when the gospel had yet to be preached? Jesus wasn't dead. They were still under the law. And until Jesus took his last breath, Jesus had the power to save who he wanted to save. And that's why Jesus said, this day, thou shalt be with me, where? In paradise. Where's paradise? Oh, he's talking about heaven. No, he's not talking about heaven. He's talking about Hades, the realm of the dead. You say, I thought when we go to, I thought when we die, we all just go to heaven. No, we go to a place called Hades, the realm of the dead. Well, there's two sides. Read Luke 16. You see Abraham with Lazarus in his bosom on one side. Then on the other side, Tartarus. See, Abraham and, and Lazarus was on paradise. That's where Jesus went when he died. But Jesus didn't stay there. He got up. You say, well, the Bible says... To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Don't you know the, the presence of God is in Hades? I wish I had more time. You see, that Hades hell is not the lake of fire, Gehenna hell. Lake of fire, Gehenna hell is the second death. That's where you don't want to go. Amen, somebody. You say, well, that's away from the presence of God. I wish you'd take the Godhead class so you can understand that even God's presence is in the lake of fire too. Yes, 